the first thing to realize is that the word artificial in the phrase artificial intelligence is real. And that's not due to me, it's due to one of the pioneers of the subject who was, happens to be a Christian. And the point is that, and we'll take a narrow AI system first because it's much easier to explain. A narrow AI system is a system involving a high-powered computer, a huge database, and an algorithm that does some picking and choosing, that whose output is something that it normally requires human intelligence to do. That is, if you look at the output, you would say normally that it's taken an intelligent person to do that. So let's take an example that is very important these days in, in medicine, and that's X-ray, interpreting X-rays. So we have a database. Let's say it has one million x-rays of lungs that are infected with various diseases, say related to COVID-19. They are then labeled in the database by the world's top experts. Then they take an x-ray of your lungs or my lungs, and the algorithm compares the x-ray of your lungs with the million very rapidly. And it produces an output which says, John Anderson has got that disease. Now, at the moment, that kind of thing, which is being rolled out not only in radiology, but all over the place, will generally give you a better result than your local hospital will. And that's hugely important and hugely valuable. But the point is, the machine is not intelligent. It's only doing what it's programmed to do. The database is not intelligence. The intelligence is the intelligence of the people that designed the computer, know about x-rays, and know about medicine. But the output is what you would expect from an intelligent doctor. So it's in that sense artificial. It's a system narrow in the sense it only deals with one thing. And all kinds, endless kinds of, of systems are being rolled out around the world. And some of them, as you mentioned, are extremely beneficial. Narrow AI has been used in the development of vaccines, and the spin-off from that technology is enormous in drug development. And on and on it goes, and I could give you dozens of examples and uh, they're in my book. So that's, that's where we start. Now, we are familiar with it, and it's worth giving a second example of it, because most of us voluntarily are wearing, first of all, a tracker. It's called a smartphone. Yes. It knows where we are. It could be even recording what we're saying. But what it does do, of which we're all aware, is if we, for example, buy a book on Amazon, we'll very soon get little pop-ups that say people that bought that book are usually interested in this book. And what's happening there is the AI system is creating a database of your preferences, your interests, your likes, your purchases and is using that to compare with its vast database of available things for sale so that it predicts what you might like. So this is of huge commercial value. And it leads to something else which most of us don't know about, and we can come to that later, but I'll mention it now, which is called surveillance capitalism. And uh, there's a book by an emerita professor at MIT called Susanna Zuboff. And it's regarded as a very serious book because the point she's making is global corporations are using your data and without your permission are selling it off to third parties and making a lot of money out of it. And that raises deep privacy issues. So now you're straight into the ethics. So that's narrow AI. 
Okay, so let's stay on narrow AI and extend our road a little bit further down towards broader use. You've just talked about us being unaware of, in a way, of how we're being surveilled. Yes. And it was right here in Oxford. I think it may have been you who made the point. I can't remember. Uh, in a talk that I heard where the point was made that what's happening in China using artificial intelligence to surveil people is astonishing, but in many ways all that information has been collected in the West as well. It's just it's not collated in the that, same that's way. That's correct. And uh, this is perhaps one of the scariest aspects of it. What we're talking about here is facial recognition by closed circuit television. Well, it starts with facial recognition, but we've now got to the stage where in China in particular, they can recognize you from the back by your gait, by all kinds of things. And what has happened is, and you can see the positive benefit, police want to arrest criminals or thugs or rowdies even in a football crowd. And so using facial recognition technology, they can pick a person out and arrest him or her. Well, okay, but what it can be used for good purposes in that sense in keeping law and order can also become, particularly in an autocratic state, become an instrument of control. And here's the huge dilemma which people try to solve. How much of your privacy are you prepared to sacrifice for security? There's a tension between those two things. 